television highlights of the news of yesteryear. soldier king of the Belgians. And here it's 19th of November, 1926, as Princess Astrid of Sweden comes to Belgium as bride of Prince Leopold. Up gangplank she comes to be greeted by joyous thousands, impressed with her beauty, happy to know their someday king will have a lovely queen. From Brussels' balcony, Bride of heir to Belgian throne waves to subjects to be. And for eight years, Princess Astrid and Prince Leopold are Belgium's most popular couple. Then in February 1934, King Albert is killed in fall while mountain climbing. All Belgium mourns. At his father's funeral, the king to be is accompanied by his brother Charles and his brother-in-law, Prince Humbert of Italy. The third king of the Belgians is dead. Long live the fourth. Then, February 24th, Leopold is prince no more, but now, like his father before him, king of the Flemish and Walloons. At 32, he's Europe's youngest monarch. And as he rides gallantly to Parliament to take oath of his new office, sadness and tragedy lie ahead of him. Not many months from now, an auto accident will kill his lovely Queen Astrid and leave him alone with three small children to rule and defend a tiny nation threatened by a Nazi Frankenstein of war. In just six short years, rule of Leopold III ends in bitter ruin. White flag of surrender flies over official car taking King of the Belgians to German headquarters as troops prepared to defend their homeland stand idly and sadly by. Here's backward glimpse into a tragic yesterday as Leopold peacefully gives his nation into hands of the enemy rather than have his tiny nation torn and trampled in vain defense of freedom. Nazis march into Belgium and Leopold goes to Germany as prisoner of war. Ten years later, on French Riviera, he meets with his one-time father-in-law, King Gustav of Sweden. Leopold is king in exile now, but back in Belgium, they're voting to bring him home and let him rule again. Did he side with the Germans for personal gain, or wisely give way under weight of more overwhelming odds to spare his country weeks of bloody conflict and months of suffering and despair? Seemingly grateful Belgium votes for Leopold's return to power. So back he comes to his native land, home of his father, throne of his forebears, to rule the Flemish and Walloons as Leopold III, King of the Belgians once again. But Belgium socialist leader Spock shouts defiance, and Leopold's troubles are by no means at an end. Street corner violence threatens to spread into full-fledged civil war. Those who hold their king on high as loyal clash with those who brand him traitor still. And bitterness between them leads to bloodshed. And Belgium is on the very brink of a disaster. Then in Parliament building where he took his oath of office, Leopold abdicates his throne. August 1950, his 19-year-old son, Prince Baudouin, assumes role of ruler under regency until he comes of age. And shyly, the young son of a fallen monarch faces his future, his people, and the world. It's 6th of February, 1929. And in New York City, influence of skyscrapers has broken into ballrooms as dancers hit a new high. With a boogie beat, each dancer pounds the floor of his own private balcony. If any 
one's leg is broken, stilts come in handy as splints. Guess it's a lumberjack on the loose, cause look out, timber! It's August 6, 1920, and with Navy Yard personnel looking on, Navy Secretary Josephus Daniels gives farewell present to his chief assistant, young Franklin Delano Roosevelt. After eight years in Navy Department, Roosevelt resigned to run for Vice President of the United States on Democratic ticket. Beaten, he retired for a while. Here left is Harlan F. Stone in 1925 with famed Speaker of the House, Uncle Joe Cannon. Attorney General of the United States, Stone has just been appointed Associate Justice of the Supreme Court by President Calvin Coolidge. Yes, here's Harlan Stone in 1925. Here with his charming wife is England's outstanding publisher, Lord Beaverbrook, on Aquitania in early 20s. And here he is again on same ship, late 20s, as Beaverbrook, now important man in British politics, makes another of his frequent transatlantic trips. On deck of liner George Washington, here's famed baritone Tito Rufo. It's 1922, and the summer was plenty hot that year. First with Chicago and Metropolitan Opera Companies, singer Rufo finished American career singing in pioneer talking pictures of 1928. of January 30th, 1931, and 250 tenants of New York's Lincoln Square Arcade are out in firelighted snow in their night clothes. Routed out of apartments just before midnight by sudden burst of blaze, homeless watch building destroyed by first five alarm fire in 25 years. Paint and oil in art studios scattered through structure feed the wind fan flames. Ten firemen and two tenants are injured and cost of disaster is in excess of $500,000. It's 1923, and in Chicago, strong man Ricardo Nelson does tricks. off more than he can chew, Nelson bends a horseshoe with his mighty molars. Just think what he could have done to the horse. Here's Nelson's idea of how to share a telephone book with your friends. Strong man with plenty of pull. It's 1929 and Sailor Sandow, 155 pounds of muscle, pulls 6,000 pounds of heavily loaded car. My grandpa, what great big muscles you have. Sky pilots showing their stuff. It's January 1932, and in Miami, Florida, airmen of United States Army, Navy, and Marine Corps put on gigantic performance under clouds of southern skies. Biggest airship at show is Akron, which thrills crowd with mid-air launching of plane. Here's one of them leaving now, as the Akron plays airport in the air. Here's stunting a la mountain climbing. These three planes are tied together as they loop and roll across the Florida field. One slip up here and all three planes will crash. That was precision flying with happy landings ahead. Mass parachute jumping is something fairly new in 1932. But spectators at Miami Air Show see 10 jumpers hit the silk and come floating down to earth without a hitch. More than 160 pilots fly in show, and here are fighters in simulated battle. 
And here are bombers taking dead aim at their target. Now watch this carefully. One plane is out of control. Pilot gets his ship away from crowd before he jumps. Plane crashes, but no one's hurt. The waves of 1918. Here in San Francisco, California in 1918, are yo women of the Naval Reserve. The waves of 1942 as they looked in World War I. Not quite as sharply and snappily dressed as the uniformed women one war later, they're just as stylish for the times and ready for duty. Indian on Long Path. Four Indians are among 136 contestants in New York to Long Beach Marathon. It's 16th of May, 1927, and man who's never before seen paved streets is putting miles of macadam behind him. He's Hopi Indian, Kwanawahu, here beating defending champion Albert Michelson to finish line. Kwanawahu, winning long run in record time. Smith in speedy swim. It's September 1928 as 330 swimmers leap into cold waters of Lake Michigan off shores of Chicago. It's third annual two mile swim for women. And among early leaders is 17 year old Isabella Smith. Already winner in previous contest, young Miss Smith again shows form of champion as she strokes through waters of Lake Michigan and tags up well ahead of her nearest rival. Nice going. Miss Isabella Smith, twice winner of Chicago's two-mile marathon. 